Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Marsha, too, for inviting HST to Cypress U for yet another year. Uh, we always look forward to coming here. It's always a great event. And um, what I'd like to do also is say thank you to, to uh, your team, too. Uh, in the agenda, you talked about how we've grown exponentially uh, as partners. And I think it's all attributable to, to your team and how well they support us. So we appreciate that. With that being said, um, I think everyone's been pretty well versed on reference-based pricing. So I'm just going to br brush over basically a little bit about HST and then get into you know, how, how we've been meeting expectations as far as what we promised from a financial perspective and then also uh, implementation perspective. So you know, Tom Harrington just teed it up very nicely for us with, you know, it's, it's a little disruptive, it's a little bit of a change. Um, it's an alternative to the traditional PPO health plan that so many uh, people are familiar with. But you know, when you have 10% inflation or 8% inflation, uh, double-digit annual renewals, we want to try and bring in a solution that bends that cost curve down when it comes to your overall medical spend. And what HST does is we use our technology to actually focus on more of the high-dollar hospital claims. So when you look at your overall medical spend, you have doctors and hospitals. And, and doctors really aren't the issue with, with the price, price that you see every year. Um, it's the hospitals. They're charging, you know, typically three times uh, what Medicare charges when hospitals actually make money off of Medicare. So we're really trying to get those costs down. And for us, uh, we usually uh, use 140 percent of Medicare uh, to get that price down and save our clients significant, significant dollars. And I'll take you through some of those statistics on, on uh, how we get there. <clears throat> Uh, just uh, for some of those that uh, reference-based pricing or value-based payments is new to, um, all we're doing is using Medicare or cost information to determine what the prevailing rate is for medical services in a particular geography. Um, instead of doing the top-down approach, so with the PPOs, it's the hospitals are going to inflate the charge, the, the, the carrier is going to come in, and we're going to get you a 50% discount off of six, seven, eight times Medicare. So you get to that three times or four times Medicare, which is not working for many people. So this is why it makes sense, because we're working bottom up and, and using Medicare as a baseline and applying 40% above that, which is, I think, a decent margin in any type of business that you have. Uh, we're also cre creating transparency, because we have the technology to get out in front of these claims. So 90% of the time in the hospital setting, when it's elective, if you're going in for a knee procedure, we're proactively going out to the hospital and telling them what the price is up front and that's really allowed us to create consumerism within the healthcare space that's been missing all these years. Uh, we also look at quality metrics. Let's hold them accountable for what they're there for, quality. So we look at number of procedures done, readmission rates, length to stay, and how do they compare to their peers in that particular market. Now for our overall statistics, we have 700 clients nationally, 700,000 members on our plan. Uh, at 140% of Medicare, we have a 98% acceptance rate, so right in line with what Tom was saying, we have less than 2% pushback. Uh, if you look at our discount off of billed charges, if you want to look at it from that perspective over the last decade, it's been 72.3%. And from a medical claims savings perspective, we're saving between 20 to 30% on overall medical spend. And that just depends on uh, if you're using a BUCA, so Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, typically they're about 20%. If you're using a rental network like PHCS Multiplan, we're, we're more at 30%. Uh, and then average savings uh, per member is 12,792, and ROI for every dollar spent, uh, our clients are saving $55 on that dollar. <clears throat> now with Cyprus, so how, how are we doing? Are we meeting expectations? So we have, uh, in 2018, we had 42 clients with us. We've since grown to over 50 uh, with the one, one uh, new business that we brought on. Uh, and then with Lucent, we actually have 150 employer groups uh, that, are, that are on the HST value-based payments health plan. So we have significantly grown together. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's just been a great partnership for us. Uh, just to give you a little profile on the clients we have, we've, we've gotten as low as 20. Uh, our largest client with Cyprus is 2,500 currently. Uh, and average savings for our clients is north of $1.6 million. Uh, with discounts ranging on the low end to uh, 63%, all the way up to 84% uh, for those clients. We're in all 50 states. Um, we have all different types of industries, trucking, construction, healthcare, um, you know, food and beverage. I think what it really, when it makes sense for a group, it's when you look at that medical spend and you look at the doctors compared to the hospital, and if you're spending maybe 40% of the, your dollars in the hospital setting, this may be something to look at. <clears throat> now, our overall dashboard for Cyprus in 2018, we had $98 million in billed charges. We got it down to an allowable amount of $27 million, uh, saving uh, just under $71 million or a 72% discount 
off of billed charges, and this was representing over 17,000 enrolled employees across the country. And if you look at the uh, claims volume we have, so <clears throat> you'll see Tennessee, Wisconsin, obviously where Cyprus is located, uh, Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, uh, those, are, those are kind of our, our busier states. Um, Tennessee, we've definitely um, brought on a lot of employer groups down there, but then also we have employers that are domiciled throughout the country that have members going to facilities in other states too. But th this is kind of what, what we've broken down as far as where the members are going. And then by region, so if you look out west uh, and then the southeast, that's where we're outperforming our benchmark is 72.3%. Uh, and then if you look at the upper Midwest, uh, not as high, but that's because we have some provider contracts in place there. Uh, the providers also are not billing as significantly higher as some of the other facilities, but it's still gonna save you money. Uh, normally what we're seeing with the book is, you know, uh, best case scenario, you're getting a 55% discount off of billed charges. So 66% uh, is still a win in my book. And then uh, top five facilities. So as I mentioned, we, we have a lot of business in Tennessee. Um, we also have in Iowa, we have a large client there. Uh, we have a school district in, uh, in the northwest portion of Wisconsin as well. And then you look at the, the high dollar claims. So $286,000 on the low end there, all the way up to $460,000. Now, if you look at this, I think if you talk to the stop loss carriers, I just mentioned normally you'll see a 55% discount with the Bucas. As the dollars get higher, that discount tends to diminish. So it may come down to 45, 40%. They have exposure, you have exposure. Uh, this is really where we actually improve with our discount. You'll see us get up into the 80s, sometimes 90s uh, when, with, with that regard. And these are the types of claims that could you know, destroy a company with their, health, uh, with their uh, medical spend. So um, that's where we, we really wanna try and protect you from that kind of exposure. <clears throat> And then uh, top 10 facilities uh, from a savings perspective. So Baptist Memorial in Memphis, we have a lot of, a lot of employees um, and members going to those facilities there. Uh, and then you have uh, more, uh, more, um, more facilities in Tennessee. You have uh, even a dialysis center there. We do very well with dialysis. Typically we're seeing discounts north of 80% uh, for those, those types of services. Um, and then you have uh, TriStar uh, in, in Nashville. That's actually the facility that I think Tom was alluding to. That's been kind of a challenge for us. Uh, there's, there's certain facilities like HCA where, you know, in certain parts of the country they're a challenge. But because we get in front of these claims, we'll flag them as a red facility and try and redirect members uh, to some of those other facilities. But most of the other ones on there, uh, I'd say Centura kind of pushes back a little bit, but the others, other ones are uh, accepting at a high rate too. <clears throat> And then uh, pushback, obviously this is the, the elephant in the room when we're talking about the HST model. So PAC stands for our Patient Advocacy Center. Uh, we have processes in place with our advocates out in our home office. They're there to assist the member. Um, as Tom mentioned, the communication is critical. If they get a balanced bill, get us involved right away. We'll take over on their behalf and start working with the facility. Um, and these, these are the statistics that we have here. So, uh, out of almost 55,000 claims, we had 492 cases come in over the year uh, that were impacting 422 members. Um, and then from there, it breaks it down to um, certain actions that were taken. So 197 LOAs, that means that our advocates negotiated within the corridor that we are allowed to negotiate within. So it's usually 140% to 200% of Medicare. So we came to an agreement at say 170, 180. We got a letter of agreement in place, the member went in for services. Uh, VVP accepted. Sometimes the provider just needs some education. They get on a call with us, we explain how the reimbursement works. They're okay with that, we move on from there. Um, and then you have reopened. So under ERISA law, hospitals have 180 days to exhaust their rights. Um, if they don't give us a response within the, the 180 days, um, they may, we may close that out. Um, they may come back to the member and balance bill them, so we may have to reopen that case and start over again uh, with regards to that. And then we had 103 that were exhausted under the 180 days there. Uh, average closure for the members was 61. It's a little higher, usually we're about 45 to 60 days, um, and it's all about how responsive the hospitals are. Um, our advocates are reaching out to the facilities either weekly or bi-weekly. They're keeping the member apprised every seven to 10 business days. We wanna get these closed out immediately, but if services are, have been rendered, they may take a little bit of time uh, getting back to us to try and get these issues resolved. But our goal is always to get that number uh, below 60, so we're, we're right on the cusp there. <clears throat> And then as far as where we're seeing most of the pushback for all the members um, with, with Cyprus, 
Tennessee, as I mentioned, that's expected because that's where most of our membership is for uh, the employees under, under the Cypress Health Plans. Uh, Nebraska, we have uh, a, an employer there that's dealing with a facility that tends to push back uh, a little more often. And then uh, the state of Colorado is a, is a state that, that's kind of a challenge for us from a, from a reference-based pricing or value-based payments uh, standpoint. But other than that, um, I think you know, our, our numbers are running um, at or below uh, our 2% of pushback. <clears throat> The other thing too is every claim comes, comes our way from Cyprus. We get daily feeds from them. Um, what we'll do is we actually scrub them. Uh, we, make, we validate them. We make sure that they meet all Medicare standards and guidelines. But there's a number here that we actually have to reject because they're not properly billed. Uh, they'll try and double dip. Uh, they'll, they'll pull out uh, pricing that's already bundled into Medicare. We kick a lot of those extra charges out. And as long as it's a clean claim, we push it back to Cyprus, repriced at 140% of Medicare to be paid out within two weeks. <clears throat> And then top 10 uh, inpatient procedures by volume. So here you see, you know, on the low end, 70% discount off a of build all the way up to 88%. Um, you know, you have, uh, you know, say the, the one for, um, you know, 11,000. You know, you're seeing significant dollars here, but th what this isn't really showing is those higher dollar claims that I mentioned earlier, um, where we had the $460,000 claim. We recently had a $1.1 million claim come in that we repriced to $177,000 or an 84% discount off of build charges. Pretty significant savings with those inpatient claims that could really uh, hammer a company. And then by volume here, it's a lot of your imaging, ER visits. Uh, again, we're, we have an outlier there at 61%, but you see some that are at 99%. You see that 16891 claim that's repriced to $106. People can't believe it, but this is what we're doing for our clients. And then what's been nice too, uh, last year we rolled out our, our new member app uh, kind of on a pilot basis and now this year we've actually bundled it into our pricing. Um, we wanna share our data with the members. Uh, it's, this, is, this is a tool that uh, no one else has. Uh, what they could do is members can go on the iPhone or Android, they could actually look up a procedure they're having. So let's just say they're going in for a knee procedure, they plug it in, they, they look for facilities within 50 miles. They're gonna see the whole range of facilities within that radius. It's gonna show them the, the range of highest to lowest charge. Typically, we'll see del deltas of $100,000 or greater. And then it's just like Yelp. They go through it, they look at the facilities, they'll see pricing information, they see quality uh, ratings. So they'll see is it a one-star rated facility or five-star rated facility. And it's interesting, some of the data on there, some of the highest charging facilities are, have the lowest quality care and vice versa. You may have a community hospital that's four-star rated, charging a reasonable amount. Um, and then their out-of-pocket's minimal too. They'll actually see what their out-of-pocket is too. So they see that, what, what kind of skin they have in the game. Uh, the other thing too is if they get a balanced bill, they could take a picture on their phone and upload it to the app and open up a case on the phone and get updates on there as well. So there's a lot of really good information for them at their fingertips, giving them that transparency to try and drive down that cost. <clears throat> And then you know, our technology, we've had it for 10 years and we've continued to build it uh, to, to work you know, in, our, on, in our favor for things such as the app, but also with negotiating with facilities. Uh, we had Cypress out to our headquarters uh, back in the, in the fall. Uh, we had our engineers meet with them, give them a look under the hood and look, look at the analytics. We have you know, cost to charge ratios, we have the app. Uh, we show them how we scrub the claims. Uh, we have facility data. So if we wanna do direct contracting, which you know, Luke Berry mentioned earlier, that's a big thing for us too. That's the way we see this model evolving is not just have reference-based pricing or value-based payments, but also latching on to a, a safe harbor facility where it's still open access, but we're gonna try and direct members to those partners of ours that will accept a, a negotiated rate, so we'll have zero pushback. If they go anywhere else, HST will be there to reprice and offer advocacy for any of those members falling outside of that. And um, that's actually something that we've done with Advocate Healthcare in Chicago. Um, we've done it with Methodist Hospital out in Los Angeles. We're having conversations with Beaumont and Detroit. Um, so it really makes sense and it's working out well for us for the initial partnerships that we've had um, in utilizing this data to leverage those, those contracts. Any questions? <clears throat> so my question is around stop loss. Um, uh, you know, the carriers I've talked with are, they're kind of crawling before they run with with reference-based pricing. Um, I had a recent conversation with Symmetra. They actually were, they were doing something around reference-based pricing and it kind of caught them because a very, very large claim came in that they could not get repriced, um, yet they had discounted a certain amount. So 
Um, if you could be maybe even sp specific with some carriers that you know are recognizing uh, the extra 20 to 30 percent. Uh, so instead of providing a 55 percent on the manual, which is pretty standard, as you said, yeah. maybe they're putting in a 75 percent uh, discount in the manual or something of that nature. Sure. No, that's a great question. It's, it's definitely important to have the right partners and all the stop loss carriers in the back of the room, they've written plenty of cases with us. Uh, they get it. They discount it accordingly. Uh, normally, we're seeing an average of 20 percent uh, on stop loss. It's not for everybody, but um, that's typically what we're seeing on the, uh, uh, the spec deductible and uh, 5 to 15 on the aggregate. But the other key thing, too, is if you do have claims that go sideways, they will work within that corridor. Um, and, and typically, we'll see them work even above the corridor of 200 percent. Um, so that having that in place, too, is really critical because we've seen um, certain ones that, like you talked about with Symmetra, um, we do have groups with them, but sometimes we hear about them not, you know, they may understand one group better than the other. Sometimes you're not talking to the right people at uh, those particular places, too. But uh, it is critical that you work with the right stop loss par uh, partners to get the pricing and the protection. Anybody else? So I do. Can everybody hear me? You can hear me all right, right? Um, talk about geography. Does it matter? I mean, there, you know, there, there's all those stories about Indiana being the worst state yeah. for VVP and all that. So what, what works and what doesn't geographically? Yeah, I mean, uh, Colorado and Indiana are probably the two states I always think of uh, from, from a pushback standpoint. With that being said, we, we brought on a, a group, a 1400 Life group with Lucent this year. Um, it's going well so far. It's still early. Obviously, we're going to see, you know, that group become more mature. Um, and we're, we're reaching out to facilities in that state, too. So we've had conversations with, with Deaconess there, um, Beacon Health. Um, you know, but if it doesn't make sense, then maybe put a PPO network for the population that's in those states, and then maybe value-based payments in the other parts of the states. And then once we start having more direct agreements in place, maybe we could transition those people over to the HST model. Some are okay with the, uh, with the noise. If their backs are up against the wall, like the Indiana group that we've run on, we, we made them well aware that there's, you know, a significant amount of pushback in the state. Uh, as long as we level set, and, and I think we, that's something we have to do too, is, is level set uh, not only on states but also on the disruption when you transition to this health plan. Um, and I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but the physician-only network, we usually use a PHCS or PHS multi-plan or health smart as a, a physician-only network. That could be a little bumpy in the beginning because it's not as good as a, as a Buka network. So. Um, some of the things that we've done, and, and you talk about the evolution all the time, is we've gotten great feedback from Cypress. That's a really key thing about the partnership is they've helped us tweak the model. Um, concierge is big now. Members have one point of contact because it could look clunky. I mean, we have all these partners in here, and it could be confusing. So I think the concierge makes a lot of sense. Um, but then also just having a lot of support during implementation and then go live. Um, we've tried to make a lot of improvements and, and made some big strides in, in that regard. State of the art when it comes to employee education, because as we've established that you you got to communicate this with your employees. Have you come up with the best practice for that? I mean, we have a number of resources on our on our portal. I think with us, um, you know, this last year, or I should say, in the last six months, uh, we've mandated that our account managers get more involved with the account managers from Cyprus, um, so that when we're doing the implementation, we're kind of walking them through the resources that we have, but we also want to be, you know, uniform in, in what kind of messaging you have. You guys have given us great feedback to say maybe you don't want to use something that we're recommending too. So I think it's just about putting our heads together and coming up with the right messaging for the employees. And then um, our CEO says it's all about communication, communication, communication. So you got to hammer it home, uh, do drip campaigns after the go live date because sometimes they're drinking from a fire hose, those sort of yeah. things. <clears throat> I'm just curious, of the employers in here, how many of you are uh, using value-based reference base right now? So, pretty good amount. How's it going? <clears throat> we're in the Kansas City uh, market, and we're in year three of reference-based pricing, and it, it has been pretty challenging. I think um, <clears throat> our particular market, there's some big facilities that are really not playing ball, so with the benefit of, and subsequently you've given us kind of your uh, experience with the hospitals in our geography. So with the benefit of hindsight, I think we would say avoid these two facilities, KU Med and St. Luke's. Uh, Are you gonna do that? Yeah, we already have. I mean, we haven't said you can't go there, but we've, 
we basically have communicated to people, these facilities are really not playing balls, so we need to avoid them. Um, and, and then, you know, I mean, I think our statistics are quite a bit different than the two to three percent. I, I think our our balance bills, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, we're currently probably working through, I don't know, Jeff, what, 10 or 15? So, I mean, it's just, it's it's been a lot of noise. It's been very educational. Um, you know, it's just, I, I think we weren't really prepared. We just jumped in and, you know, subsequently did a ton of education. You know, we know more. Our people are much more acclimated to it. And then we're, we're trying to just kind of clean clean up the issues we have and kind of get things more, a little more even keel. How has so. it affected your cost? <clears throat> um, you know, it's, I mean, I mean we're, we're looking at pretty good percentage savings, but uh, we, you know, we've got probably 200,000 in unresolved bills. And uh, the, the facilities that are a problem, I mean, they're billing 1,000 to 2,500% of Medicare. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, we have engaged Sentry on the legal side to try to negotiate some of these. So, you know, you get, you get a bill from KU Med for, you know, 1,200% uh, or 2,000% of Medicare, and the best we can do is a 50% discount. You know, so we're, you know, we're paying on a couple of bills 1,000% of Medicare just to make them go away. So, it, you know. And we, we met with KU Med a couple weeks ago, too, because we knew about, you know, you and some others down there. That, and that's where the managed care portion comes in is get those contractors down in those high pushback areas a little more yeah. and try and mitigate some of that pushback. And at least KU Med is negotiating. <clears throat> um, St. Luke's, which probably has the biggest footprint in Kansas City, they have pretty much drawn a line in the sand. So we've gone the legal route uh, with St. Luke's, and so far there's been no movement, so... You know, it's, it's been interesting. Yeah, interesting is one word for it. But so you've got you've got someone who's, who's charging you two thousand percent of Medicare, and you're, they're they're kind enough to give you a fifty percent discount, which means you're paying a thousand percent of Medicare. How is that right? I mean, this is, now I'm going to get pissed. But so <laughs> how is that right? And how do they possibly justify doing that for you? Do they? Well, and I think the the, the speaker from FIA hit it right on the head. You know, I mean, when are these people going to wake up? You know, do they want single payer? You know, I mean, they just got to cut, they, they got to manage their greed a little better. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just was going to say, too, the hospitals have to be careful. I mean, they're, they're having a lot of leakage to outpatient uh, sur surgeries, whatever, outpatient services. Um, United Healthcare is competing directly against them. That's their highest margin business, and they're willing to lose all that. And then at, at some point, they're just gonna be dealing with all the complex care in their hospitals and they could potentially be losing money off those services. So uh, these transparency tools are important. That's one thing about the app that I didn't mention is you're actually gonna see red, yellow, green facilities on your mm -hmm. phone so the member will, will know ahead of time, okay, I'm willing to take the chance or no, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna to go to this other facility and I know what the quality is there. Yeah, in, in Advent, mm -hmm. I just bought one of our, our bigger facilities and, and they're on board with uh, reference-based pricing. So they're, you know, they're basically saying, hey, you know, we'll be more than happy to, to do 140% of Medicare. So, you know, there are some facilities that I think see this as an opportunity to gain some market share. Yeah. Okay, so of the brokers <clears throat> in the room, how many of have sold reference space to their clients? How's it going? How has it gone? How'd you do it? So, you know, being in Colorado, we have, um, you know, some of the highest cost facilities in the country being in the mountains. Um, so it really started with clients up there, you know, not really having a choice. They got to do something. Um, so they have to be very, very savvy with self-funding <laughs> first. Sure. Um, and so we had um, one of, well, well, our two Cyprus cases were January and March. A um, lot of pain for <laughs> in January. I had an HR person diagnosed with breast cancer the second day of the plan. Wow. Um, so you kind, we kind of didn't even get a chance to really get it going, but it's smoothed out since then. There's definitely been huge savings. We definitely saw it in the stop loss. Um, and um, so we're, we're still kind of, you know, keeping an eye on that. I do have another group, won't say who it's with, but in that region, incredible um, 
difference in how the hospitals look at them. They're a provider office themselves. So when they have a balanced bill, the CFO is calling the CFO, and they're yeah. having a conversation around why, why are you charging this? So it's kind of changing some of the culture up there, which is awesome. Yeah, good. Matt, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, we, we heard from some of the other solutions, you know, before you, and we talked about, you know, finding a surgery for a lower cost and the employee having no out-of-pocket cost for that, and, you know, and it, you know, we're not taking benefits from them on one side, they just have an option to do that. What percentage of the employers are actually giving their employees better benefits because they're putting them into reference-based pricing? Meaning, you know, if I'm at a $6,500 deductible today and I'm at wit's end and I'm not happy with what I have, but I'm going to reference-based pricing because it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to save money, am I giving my employees a better benefit for being in that solution or do I still have a $6,500 deductible and out-of-pocket? What percentage are doing a more comprehensive program? I think what most do is they keep their plan design the same uh, for that first year because they want to make sure that we meet expectations from a savings standpoint. Are you seeing the adjust? Yeah, great point. And are you seeing the adjustment though in the future years? Like you know, the one example uh, with the bakery, you know, quite a bit of savings there, right? Yep. So is that are those plans getting more comprehensive for the employees? Because yeah, I mean, it's I, tough. I, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and that actually gives us a lot of leverage when we go to negotiate with the hospitals because sure. our clients who get it, you know, they they if they save the uh, you know million dollars, they're going to say, let's take you know fifty, you know, hundred of it and put it towards richer plan design, so lower the deductible, lower the coinsurance. Um, it gives you more leverage, right? Get rid of it all together. Yeah, yeah, get rid of it all together. And then when we go to the hospitals, we'll say, hey, how, how about if we take you out of the collections game? We right. have our groups that have richer plan designs. You have less dollars to chase after because when we do have these conversations, every hospital has a dollar amount. We, we know Sutter Healthcare in California said $1,200 is, when, when they have a member that has $1,200 or greater, they collect 1% of that. Right. So that's a, and it's probably a little bit of an exagger exaggeration, but. You know, it's, there's some expo there's a lot of exposure there. So yeah, and I, I just think that's something for employers to think about when they're looking at getting into it, and definitely you know take that first year so you've got the comparison to prove that it worked, but actually reward your employees a little bit too with some better benefits. Then it gives you guys better leverage as you go to do the negotiation, just like some of these narrow <coughs> networks are doing and these direct contracts are doing. The, the hospitals, their their advantage is they don't want to be in the collections business, and that's why they're able to give up some of that. And that's what we're also, uh, the other uh, thing about it is we're, that's what we've done with Advocate. So Advocate, if you go to use that facility, there's just co-pays, no deductible, no co-insurance. If you go to one of their competitors like Northwestern or Rush, you have at least a 30% co-insurance. There's a deductible, a max out of pocket. So the member's incentivized uh, to go to those, those safe harbor facilities and providers. And one last question. You know, I think the employers, once they understand reference-based pricing, they understand their risks, they understand the balance billing, they understand the negotiations, I think they have a good concept of that. What percent, I think everybody's fear with reference-based pricing, especially from the employee standpoint, is I'm going to get denied cover. You know, I'm going to be standing there waiting to go into a procedure and I can't do it, you know, yeah. because they're not going to allow me through the doors. What percent do you see that happen where you guys got to get involved in that? Uh, you know, normally it's uh, it's more on the like the TPA is dealing with them more often because it's on the, the doctor side. Um, they'll loop us in sometimes to see if you can get uh, or have our contracting team reach out and just set up a letter of agreement with that that particular medical practice or whatever it may be. But um, if they're denying coverage on the hospital side, we're just going to try and identify the other facilities, and then if it's emergent, they have to take them. So we'll just deal with whatever pushback we have to on the back end. But there's ACA regs that support reference-based pricing from the emergency standpoint. Um, we, we have a number of different approaches we could take we, if we have to take a sterner approach, but we always try to reach out collaboratively and work with them. Um, if they don't want to work with us, then again, we're going to red flag them and try and redirect as much business away as possible. Thanks, buddy. Yep. Question in the back. Um, just to answer the question of what the gentleman had just asked, um, whenever I go into a discussion, I'm the benefits consultant. Uh, with a group that's going to do reference-based pricing because there is a lot of noise. I always tell them I want it to be a win-win for both the employer to save money but also employees to have a better holistic um, plan design. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell you for one of my groups, they had big savings for reference-based pricing year over year. This year they increased um, the company-sponsored life insurance. They got a company-sponsored long-term disability plan. Um, they gave a bigger contribution towards the dental 
and uh, they also gave a company-sponsored vision plan. So the company still saved money, and they added in four new benefits for employees. That's awesome. Yeah. Something to think about, not just the medical plan, but also just enhancing the overall package.